when you think about it, how often do you, you know, I can't do this again. I can do Equitana USA. I can do Equus Film and Arts Fest. I can do you and me doing stuff again. I can do the Tryon International Film Festival again. Um, but I can never do the, the Olympics in Tokyo again, unless I live to be 200 years old and it happens there again. Welcome back to Winnie Tales. In this episode, you'll hear from Bruce and Julianne in our first episode of Season 3. We'll also chat with Diana DeRosa about her equestrian Olympic journey to Tokyo. Welcome to Winnie Tales. I'm your host, Julianne Neal, and we're here with Bruce Anderson and friends with all of our favorite horse stories, pony legends, and unicorn yarns. Tune in each week to hear from Bruce with a Nature's View training tip, as well as conversations with some of our favorite horse lovers. Remember, the joy's in the ride. We're back. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We are back. We're sitting on the back porch. Where it all started. Yes. And hanging out with Maddie. It's early in the morning. Well, for us anyway. Well, for me. And our view is the sun's coming up over the oak trees. The horses are in the round pen. One is on one side of the round pen. The round pen is attached to the, to the paddocks. One horse is in the round pen, the other one's on the outside of the round pen, and they like to play through the fence. And the gate's open, so they can come and come go in, if they want. Yes. <laughs> so They're not trapped or anything. And so that's our story at this moment. Yeah. And so we're back for season three, and I have to say, we thought season two was going to be this, this time that with the pandemic isolation and everything going on that we would have all this time to do stuff but it seemed like things were busier than ever so we had a very short season two and we've, we're now ready for a new start with season three yep and sort of it, it's been an interesting journey from then to now and um we've met some new people um there are new pieces that have come up in the journey and i think the cool thing is one of the last episodes we did post was an interview with Lynn Carnes, who's been coming to you and working with you for quite some time. And we did a two-part with her, and she just came back for another session this week. And so I know we'll be, during this season, I know we'll be talking to her again. Um, we, we have a great little chat coming up on this first episode with our friend Diana DeRosa, who is getting ready to travel to Tokyo, and we'll be covering the Olympic Games. And um, with all of the closures and I don't think I don't think anybody I know in March they said that there would be no spectators from overseas but now I think they've announced no spectators at all so the equine journalists are going to be so important for us to hear the stories of of what goes on there for the games so be talking to Diana in a few minutes and then like we said some some interviews with other people and stories from Bruce about the work and what would you say has been um an interesting development since we last last chatted, Bruce. Oh, Lordy. Um, what's fascinating is you talked about Lynn Kahn. When she came back to work with us again, she brought a couple of books that she'd been writing and a manuscript that she wanted to share. And it's sort of interesting because the impression I get is through the work, it has taken her journey to a whole new level, to where she's a lot more impeccable with being able to help others to help themselves. So this has helped her to be more impeccable with her journey um, in helping other people. And I think a cool thing about Lynn is it just reminds me when, when we speak with her, reminds me of that interconnectedness of we're meeting so many like-minded people and it was just funny that you had a conversation. I actually had a conversation with Dwayne Hildreth out in Texas for our Brook USA podcast. Um, he's one of the board members of Brook USA. And he's friends with Lynn. 
who is also friends with your artist friend Tammy Tappan and and Tryon, and so just meeting different people who all all have that same spirit, and um, it's it's just fun to see how many people all are interconnected, you know, in the background that we didn't even realize. So that's been fun. And like some of the things, I I, I was at the horse park here in in Camden, and um, every now and then. There's always somebody that's having a little bit of a hard time loading their horse. And I very carefully and gingerly go and offer my assistance. And um, in so doing, I met this family. It's the grandmother, her daughter, and one of the grand uh, granddaughters. And um, it's a story of all three of them. And they, ha- they, I, they have a little name for themselves, their, their little herd. They call themselves the little herd or something of the sort. And it's all about their experience coming out to the round pin. So hopefully we were going to get to chat with them. And that's pretty cool because you're talking about three generations and how this work is impacting three generations. And the whole point behind this work is to show why horses are so important, more so now than ever before, because of the environment but before that can happen we have to start being humane to ourselves and it's funny because I also have well I have a couple of nieces one of my nieces lives in Canada and she's going through a moment right now where in Canada it's there's a big to do about the indigenous people and she loves the land and she has a little pot of, plot of land where she lives that she grows every year. And I guess she's with this uprise in the awareness of the indigenous people, she suddenly realized in digging in the dirt that they were there at one point digging before her. And she is trying to find a way to honor their memory um, and sort of figure out how to pay back to these people who have paid such a high price. I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that the best way to honor them is to get back in touch with our natural self. And I feel that this work and the horse allows you to do that. And by so doing, you know, you have gotten to where you are on the backs of these people um, by so doing and breaking this and getting back in touch with your nature. Um, and changing the philosophy of taking something that is less and using it to enrich yourself, which is how this all came about, to going back to what we're supposed to be, which I feel anyway, is to be the steward, which is to take something that is less, careful with the word less, and lift it up. And the byproduct, you then shall be lifted up. And these are some of the stories that we hopefully will share with you well, I think the cool thing is all of those situations, all of those people, you're using all these different situations and scenarios and locations, and um, it, the the constant is the horse. And so I think we're going to have a great a great time talking to some of the folks that you mentioned. Um, I, what I do love is that that first group, the herd that you talked about. Um, you first met when they were having some trailer loading issues and to me trailer loading is one of those things that horse people always come having problems or not always but a lot of them come having problems with trailer loading because um, if you've had horses through your life you know at some point you're going to end up with one that that doesn't actually like to get on the trailer so that becomes a way of using that situation to work on what you call alpha so we're, we're i think we're going to try to try to delve into that a little bit we um which is the... funny that you say that because another story that we're working with is i am not from america i am from a little island or twin islands in the caribbean called trinidad and tobago in coming here to small town camden out in the country in the South, you have to understand that being a foreigner, an outsider, you are not welcomed necessarily into the fold 
because these are people who have been here generation after generation. It's a tight group. They do not let just anybody in. And there was this gentleman called Alan Wooten, uh, Big Alan he's known as. And he took me under his wing in a sense and would take me hog hunting. Now this was years ago, right? Years ago. Years he ago. unfortunately has passed yeah. um, hunting in a hunting accident. Um, but he was the first person that made me feel that I belong here. And I now have the opportunity to work with his granddaughter, who is somewhat of a quiet young lady, who called me up because she had this horse. It would load in another trailer if there's another horse in it, but if there's no horse in it, it won't load and not only that, if you do get it on, it's very uncomfortable being in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she called me up and asked for help. When I checked with the mother, because she's underage, if I can work with, with her, the mother was in shock, first of all, that she called for help. Secondly, that she called me for help, because I have a little bit of a reputation around here. Um, with those who don't really know what I do. Um, and when the mother heard that the daughter was going to work with us, she was, I would like to think, pleasantly pleased. Um, and I have been working with her, with this horse, in trail loading. And it's interesting the method in which I am charging her. Um, that's an interesting story, which I guess I won't get well, into. Yeah, we'll tell that one in a different episode, so that. It, but we <laughs> it do will have give us something to look forward uh, to. We do have a couple of trailer well, loading stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's kind of funny because that seems to be that's a great demonstration for people who come thinking, okay, I got I got this horse, I got this problem horse, and so trailer loading is something that we always come back to, just as a way of looking at where your horse is mentally um so in fact when we did the equitana online demonstration last year it was a trailer loading thing so so that was a lot of fun anyway for today we'll be speaking with actually i'll be speaking with diana de rosa bruce i don't guess you get to get in on this one but we'll catch you up on the next one and um i hope that everyone's enjoying the sounds of the porch it's um it, you know with all the zoom calls and the digital things that we're into these days it's kind of nice to be finally back to sitting outside and in a natural environment and moving forward from there so so w thank you for joining us on this first episode of our third season we appreciate your support and thank you for everything and i have to say one of the things that i always say we use time as a reference so i have an appointment to work with a horse trailer loading <laughs> um at nine o'clock to work with teresa teresa I apologize for being late, <laughs> but I am not sorry for the reason that I'm late because we're doing this podcast. So if you hear me, Teresa, now you know. <laughs> Why he's late. So, well, that's <laughs> no, all we're relative. Not that late. We're not that late. Yeah, speak so, for yourself. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to season three. Have a good one. We'd like to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Espana Silk. Formulated with a light, refreshing fragrance, this European-inspired line of grooming products has been developed to provide superior conditioning and moisturizing for people and animals. Using silk as part of your grooming routine promotes healthy hair and skin, as well as silky coats, manes, and tails. Espana Silk products are made with the finest and safest ingredients available and have been formulated to hydrate and reduce static to bring out the natural luster of your hair and your pet's coats, manes, and tails. Grooming products are all natural, water-based, pH balanced, and biodegradable. Make every day a spa day with Espana Silk. Visit their website at espanaproducts.com. Hello, Diana. Welcome back to Winnie Tales. I haven't seen you in so long, but I mean, we have been able to at least keep in touch a little bit. How are you? 
I'm I'm doing good. I'm a little little uh, stressed with uh, the Olympics coming up in just nine days and so much. I mean, I literally was at my office yesterday from 630 in the morning until almost midnight wow. and working on all Olympic stuff. You know, well, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to even sit down and chat for a few minutes because I know how it is when you're doing all that preparation and especially a trip like this is chance of a lifetime and I know you want to be sure that everything's ready. So for the folks who maybe didn't hear our episode where we, where we spoke to with, with you a couple of years ago, um, Diana is a longtime equine journalist and one of the very few people who will have the opportunity to be in attendance as with her job at the the Olympics in Tokyo. So, so Diana, I, I mean, I'd like to hear a little bit of how you got into this. You've, you've covered Pan Am Games and World Equestrian Games and seven or eight Olympics already. So how did you, how did you first decide that that was something that you'd like to do? You know, I, um, I was running a riding school for many years. And one day somebody came up and he said, uh, we would look, love to have somebody write a horse column. And I said, okay, here I am. So I became the editor of a magazine for 13 years. And during that time, actually, I got to, to travel a lot. And my opportunity came up then to cover an Olympic Games. And I grabbed on it. There was somebody that let me know the ropes and how to do it. And I, you know, I went to um, went to Korea. And uh, that for your very first Olympic Games is pretty exciting. But that was nine Olympics ago. So yeah, that's, that's how it really began. You know, I guess this goal of mine to travel internationally, when I was in sixth grade, my teacher asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to travel the world. Wow. So I've so done it. <laughs> you, knew, you knew from the beginning that this was something you wanted to continue, I'm sure then. Yeah, I mean, it would be great if I could do all these travels and just be doing it for pleasure. But in a way, it's almost more fun to do it for work because outside of not getting much sleep and everything else, you're very up close and personal. You're right outside the arena shooting everything. So you know, how, how can you beat that? Right, exactly. Well, and you were planning to go last year and then everything hit, pandemic, everything. Um, and so the postponement, did you know from the beginning, was there ever any doubt that you would try to go if they let you this year? Uh, no, there was never any doubt. I knew if they were gonna go. The only thing was that I was going to wait you know, knowing what happened last year was going to wait to make sure it was going to happen because you've got accommodations you have to pay for, you have flight you have to pay for, you've got equipment you end up buying to get prepared. So I really wanted to make sure it was going to happen before I put out that money. Mm -hmm. But there was a point of no return. They, th there came a time where they couldn't, no matter what happened, no matter if the COVID took over the world, they probably couldn't have canceled it because it would have been too much of a financial loss for them. Well, I remember in March when they said there would not be spectators from anywhere else, that no international spectators. So we kind of knew at that point the importance of your, your role and, and how, how crucial it was going to be. But I mean, now we're hearing no spectators at all. So yeah. how does that make you feel? That's a lot of pressure. Um, first of all, thank God that we're going, you know, mm -hmm. because I think the media is going to be extremely important, just like you mentioned. I mean, I, this is how people are going to share. And I hope that they're going to do some streaming, live streaming, and this is what they're going to use to get to, to get the story out there. For me, I'm actually not that upset about no spectators, other than the fact they're great pictures. But there is something that they put in place that is I probably the most scariest part of this Olympic Games for those journalists, and that is that you apply the day before to be able to go to the venue the next day. If I can't go to the venue as a photographer, I can't shoot. You don't know until six o'clock that day. My numbers may be off a little bit, but basically you don't know until six o'clock that day whether you are gonna be one of the people that is allowed to go. Can you imagine the kind of pressure that you feel from that? So my hope is that since there will be less spectators, there may be more room for us to be put in the seats where the spectators were gonna go. Oh, great. So walk me through a, a typical day. I mean, I've never, I've been to the Olympics in Atlanta. I've never been to anything anywhere else. So how, walk me through a typical day for you once you get there. What do you expect to have happen if all goes well and, and all the protocols are, are okay and you get to go? Well, the first thing that happens, I leave on the 20th and I get there on the 21st. And I get there about 
by the time I get through immigration and stuff, it probably will be closer to five o'clock. They've already forewarned us that we have four hours at least that it's going to take before we are delivered to our hotels. And they mean delivered. They are only giving us designated shuttles to travel. We have to get a COVID test when we land. We have to wait for the results to come back. And then we have to do all of this proof. I mean, in order to get in, it's been very scary because you have to do one test 96 hours before you leave, another test 72 hours before you leave. You have to prove that you got a negative COVID test. You've got to have that signed by a doctor so that it's in fact fine. Then you have to make sure you have medical insurance. You have to use these things on your, these programs on your cell phone so that you, they can um, see everything. They can know all what your activity plan is. We had to create an activity plan and that activity plan told them where we needed to be able to have access. And if we don't have what we need access to on that activity plan, we can't get in. So we had to let them know what venues we were going to, what shuttles we were using, what hotel we were going to, and the MPC, the main press center, because that's basically all I, all I can go. If I walked outside my hotel, there's going to be a guard there that is not going to let me go anywhere. Mm. The only thing they might let us do is it, for food is to go to a supermarket, but we have to be back in 15 minutes. So <laughs> that's so crazy. <laughs> Yes, and every day it's another today. They said, now you have to sign up OCHA. Every day you have to take this medical thing, you know, have to write in this medical thing every day, give them your temperature, put all of these yes and no's in, and you have to save that and submit that. It's it's pretty tough. It's pretty mm. tough. So anyway, that's my going to be my first day. But once I get actually there and going, most of the events happen at night. So we're going to end up probably working from something like five until midnight. And by the time we get back to our hotel and start working, we've probably got another six hours. So, you know, if we get back to the hotel by one, we're not going to be done until seven, eight or nine in the morning with our stories and filing our photos and stuff like that. So then we're going to try to get in a couple of hours sleep before we have to go back again. And mm. that's a shuttle ride. So, you know, you've got to figure two hours to get there. So I've, I've, I'm hearing, I may be wrong, but I'm hearing that the Heritage Zone is the main equestrian park, but then Cross Country is C, at Sea Forest, a different location. So yes. will you be able to visit and see Cross Country at all? Ahead of time, that's one of the questions I have asked. We do have a USEF person that's in charge, Carly Wildmeister, and she is basically really being helpful, giving us answers and things like that. So she's trying to see if we're going to be able to do a course walk, because how are we going to know what to shoot on the day of the event if we haven't had a chance to see the venue? So we're only scheduled at the equestrian park and then see for, see, I can't, I can never remember that name. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and uh, we're only scheduled there for the cross country. The rest is basically at the equestrian park. So we're going to be going back and forth there. And training, I did sign up for training. So if there are jogs, I'm hoping that I can attend those. The okay. other thing that's really freaking us out is being able to speak to the riders. They've mm -hmm. really put a clap on that. You know, they don't want us anywhere near the riders. They're supposed to go through the mix zone if they are in the medals. Um, we don't know if they'll be there every day. Uh, we don't know, you know, how hard it's going to be to get interviews with the help of the USEF. We're going to be doing that. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a difficult situation for us because that's our story. You know, sure. we sure. want to have our own quotes. Well, and I've noticed a lot of the, the big names are, are people that even I recognize with Laura Crowd and McLean Ward and Stephen Peters and you know all these people so I'm sure these are folks that you've already connected with at different events in the past and um, just being able to get to them and hear that hear that one-on-one -on -one, I know that's that'll be exciting I know you'll work it out <laughs> you know they have something called the mix zone so that when a rider goes and competes then they walk through the mix zone but as a photographer you know we don't like to miss shots so I don't know how difficult it's going to be especially with COVID to get to where I am with my camera to where the mix zone happening and I probably will not be able to do that so wow. now I can't even get quotes from the mix zone so hmm. we're, they are talking about possibly having virtual interviews so I'm hoping that that happens and right. we'll figure it out like you say right 
Well, and you mentioned Carly. I remember that name from the World Equestrian Games back in Tryon, and, and you already do Carly, I'm sure, very well. And that just reminded me, I've been focusing all on the COVID protocols and everything for the people. Are there different things in place for the horses? I remember it at World Equestrian Games, there was a lot. There's so much that goes into these events. So yeah. have, you, have you had a chance to really focus any on the horses and, and know anything at all about that? From my understanding, the horses or riders are going to Europe first to quarantine. And then from there, they go to Japan. And then, of course, when they get to Japan, it's going to be extremely strict for everything and anything that they do. So that's that's a given. Um, all of that, I mean, the riders, none of us are supposed to be anywhere close to each other. I mean, that's we're supposed to be social distancing. I think the mix zone is going to have those, you know, plastic things between you and yeah. And, and and there's not going to be any of the riders walking around so that we can just walk up to them and talk to them. So. Right, right. And the horses too, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty hectic. <laughs> well, well I, Bruce and I are friends with Bob Russell, who owns, co-owns a horse with McLean named Kataki. And he's just done fabulously this past year at, in, at the winter, winter things in Florida. And so I kept hoping we'd see Kataki's name and, and all on McLean's team but he's he's a small horse and I don't know if he's going or not but I'll have to send you his, his name so you can look out for him he's a cute little bay he's really really special wow, so. I guess definitely uh, yeah, yeah so, definitely yeah oh any so, you know anybody that's got contacts which you know which I really appreciate is that if anybody has contacts with any of these riders sometimes it's easier for them to actually chat with them and get maybe a quote that they can pass on to me so anybody out there that you know or anybody else knows <laughs> that has a tie-in to any of these riders I don't have to speak to the riders as long as I can get a quote from them I understand they're going to be very busy and all of that if I can speak to them now obviously that's great and I don't even need to speak to them for long but yeah. um, but hey, an owner, a groom, a yeah. significant other, I'm I'm game for any of that. Well, like Bob Bob owns with his partner uh, with his wife Alex owns Idle Hour Farm, which is a retirement place here in Camden, and Bruce and I are good friends with him. So I'll tell Bruce to call Bob and find out if Kentucky's going because if he is, that would be so great, so so great. So and speaking of all that, there are really there are three. From my understanding, there are three events, three equine events. There's dressage, show jumping, and eventing, um, and then paradressage. But that takes place a little bit later. Are you staying for the paradressage? I think that's in August, maybe. Yeah, no, it's para, it's para, you know, it's uh, disability. So, mm -hmm. no, I'm not staying for that. I'm actually leaving on July 20th, and I return on August 8th. That's almost three weeks. So that's oh, about wow. as much time as I can give. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, while you're there, I know Equus Television is going to be a big partner with you in, in providing content. How is, are they doing, following your journey every day? How is all that going to work with media? Yeah, they've, they've been fabulous. They want to really zero in and be able to share some of my information on a daily basis on their TV. And so, yes, I'm going to be sending them little snippets of information as I go. And then also I have a Facebook page called Diana's Equestrian Olympics Journey, which I would love for people to follow and hopefully ask me lots of good questions so that I can respond and let them know what the story is like. So visually and through Facebook, there are going to be a couple of ways. And then I'm fortunate enough to be covering the event for the USDF, um, which is the National uh, Dressage Federation in the United States. And I'm going to be covering for their magazine, USDF Connection, and I'm covering for Practical Horsemen. So I'm doing dressage for USDF, and then I'm doing everything for Practical. So I'll be doing stories every single day, and then final stories. And plus, I've got a bunch of photo assignments. So very busy. Busy lady, very busy. Well, and that brings me to, I see something behind you over uh, yeah. in the background, and I know we've talked about Think Tank quite a bit. What all are, I know you've packed a lot. So tell me about Think Tank and what you're taking. You know, it, it, anybody who knows me knows that there are two things I love. I love my Nikons. <laughs> I love my Nikon cameras. And I love my Think Tank bags. And I, because they just, they're designed by photographers and made photographers. And I'm bringing ones that I have from the past, but this one has wheels and it can be converted 
Um, so you can you can pull it, drag it, but then the wheels are uh, in enough, then you can open up and it's got a backpack on the back so you can actually put it on your back. So wow. I love that idea because this can be your additional, you know, your, yeah, you can bring two bags on the plane. And so that can be your additional bag. And, um, and yet it's got that ability to drag it. You know, when I go the day of, it's horrible because I'm not going to have four bags. I'm going to have my two camera bags, my dragging bag, and then my backpack. So this will be my backpack. And then I'm going to have my other bag that I'm going to put things like my clothes, but also my equipment, anything that can get into those bags. So it's a pretty tough day when I travel the first and last day. But not only do I love that, but I have a friend that does these Aspana silks. Yeah. And what I love about these things is you can use them. It seems crazy, but you can use them for different things. There's like a dry shampoo that you can use to clean clean things. And they have the shampoos that you can also use for, for putting on your face. And so mm -hmm. it actually allows you to save what you're carrying. So it's not a silk, I love you. <laughs> well, and what I love about that too, Trudy told me, Trudy Midas is the owner of the company and developed this brand. And you can use the shampoos for your dogs and your horses and your yep. hair and yeah. in your saddle. I mean, if you're going to take one thing, you better take some Espana silk with you wherever yes. you go. Uh, I keep saying to her, okay, Trudy, now you've told me that these do different things. Now, what about for toothpaste? And what about for, for cream for your face? And what about, you know, you know, if you want to wash something. And so she's teaching me, you know, you know, you use the dry shampoo, you can use the dry shampoo for that and the conditioner you can, you know, so it's fabulous. One bottle, you know, two bottles, shampoo and three bottles, actually, I'm going to do four bottles. <laughs> she's got a detangler that I love. I love, I love the detangler, the dry shampoo and then a shampoo and conditioner. So that should be basically what I need for everything. Well, and you have to take care of yourself while you're there, because like you said, you're going to be on the run and going all the time. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do about food. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I get, yeah, I get breakfast when I'm there. Um, but I'm going to bring a bunch of bars because it's going to be pretty difficult to, you know, to go to stores and stuff like that. And I don't want to spend a fortune, you know, Japan's not the cheapest country in the world. So I don't want to spend a fortune on food. So I'm going to go light. <laughs> yeah, well, good. Well, I know that you're going to have just the best time and you're going to do a fabulous job keeping uh, all of us here in the States connected. And um, that job is going to be more important than ever this year, for sure. So we appreciate yeah. you for doing it. Yeah. And I would just like to say a hi to uh, you know, uh, Lisa Dearson and uh, the... <laughs> Equus and her and Equus and Film and Festival, Equus Film and Arts Fest, and who I co-organize the event every year, the main event every year, and Equitana USA, who I'll be on, on site with uh, during their event in Kentucky. Well, so, that's exactly right. I mean, you have this to look forward to in July, but then we also have the AHP conference in Texas yeah. in September, and then Equitana in September. Is it September? October, October, October 1st to the 3rd. And then and, Common Arts Fest coming up November. And yeah. so lots and of your area. And of course, of course, you, the things you and I are going to do together, but the, the uh, Trying International Film Festival, where I do all of their uh, interviews of their filmmakers and judges and stuff. And I'll be down there this year also doing interviews on site. So and that's October also in sometime in October. That's in, um, yes, that's later in October. Yeah. October uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th, I think, are the dates for that one. Right. And, uh, and well, Film and Arts Fest is in November. Yeah, well, I, I just have to say, um, we appreciate you. I'm, I'm going to ask you one last question. I'll put you on the spot and you can tell me you don't want to answer it if you don't want to. But which one's your favorite of the, of the events? Which, which would be your favorite? Yeah, the Olympics. I'd have to say the Olympics. I mean, it's the scariest. I have to admit it's the scariest. But when you think about it, how often do you, you know, I can't do this again. I can do Equitana USA, I can do Equus Film and Arts Fest, I can do you and me doing stuff again, I can do the Tryon International Film Festival again, um, but I can never do the, the Olympics in Tokyo again, unless I live to be 200 years old and it happens there again. So yeah, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how much passion I have for international travel and my love for being in a different country and how that makes me feel. You know, New York's my home. 
And I will always come back to that. But there's nothing better than going to a foreign country and feeling like you're in this new place and learning a new culture and, and this feeling and you walk away having those memories because you've been in the Olympics, you've taken all these pictures and that's your memory. So uh, definitely it's the international events each year that are my favorite. Well, and truthfully, you connect with people so well, and that connection also represents all of us back here in the States. So that international community that you're meeting up with, you're representing all of us too. So I can't think of a better person to do that on our behalf. So thank well, you, that's what, Yeah, that's what makes me excited though, because I'm going to, you know, I'll be communicating with you, with XPTV, with X Film and Arts Fest, with the Trian International Film Festival, with Equitana USA. They'll be, you know, and I'll be in touch and we'll all be sharing. That's what it's all about, right? Well, Bruce and I feel like we're going with you anyway. So we're, we're <laughs> stowed away in your bag. We're ready. <laughs> oh, but thank you. Thank you. And we're going to be following you the whole way and um, just let us know what we can do to support. Yeah, well, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Always, Julianne. You too, Diana. Thanks. Let's take a quick break from the podcast and talk a little bit about one of our sponsors, Fenwick Equestrian. Bruce, can you tell us a little bit about why you enjoy using that with your horses? Well, to me, the first thing is what it does for me. When I put the mask on the horse, I feel that I have done everything I can do at that particular point to help the horse. I believe in the work that I do, it's all about getting the head. For everything that's sort of important to the horse is around the head. So by wrapping this around his face like it wraps, it almost creates this pressure. And in so doing, to me, letting the horse know that, look, see, you're okay. That's one. Two, when I put it on, it's letting the horse know that we're going to go to work, um, that it's work time. It's alpha time, where he is going to learn to become alpha, as opposed to flea free's fight. Also, still have that in his repertoire, um, but hopefully <laughs> he goes with alpha a little bit more. Thirdly, because of the soothing qualities that it brings. So when you add all, all of those up, I just feel that you sort of are going into starting a work day with the horse in a frame of mind of success. So yeah, um, and not only that, it's really sturdy. You've had yours for quite a while and just got a new one, but I, I, what do you do to take care of it? It's so funny. I mean, you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> I, the one, my original one that I have, I don't know how long I've had it. And yes, I got a new one, but I still like putting the old one on Marley. I don't know. How do I wash them? Okay, so the round pen that I usually work out of there is a water trough <laughs> on the outside and where the horses drink and where I shower the horses down. There's a hose right there. So when I strip the horse down, throw it in the water trough and um, give my horse a bath. At the end of the, the bath, pull it out. I've had this one, I don't know how many years. And it's like they've given me a couple more. Um, so I use the new one on the sort of the new horses, but Marley gets to have the, the, the older one. His, um, his favorite. There huh? you go. And to me, it's kind of like when you have a dog that gets a little nervous during a storm and you put a thunder coat on or something like that. It just, it's that added support. Just very pleased with it. Um, easy piece of equipment to have. Just to point out, the masks are approved for use by the Jockey Club for thoroughbreds in the racing industry, as well as show jumping and all sorts of other uses. Find out more at FenwickEquestrian.com. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Julian.